Hello, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and yali madat. My name is Noshin Hussein, and I will be the moderator for today's critical conversation. Um, today, we are talking about the history of Islam in America. And today's session will provide an opportunity for us to explore how we're taught about our own history in formal and informal education, how that affects the stories that we tell ourselves about our current experiences, and why it's important, particularly as Muslims in America, to relearn and reimagine some of these histories. Um, during this session, you will also see a Q&A box through which you can share any additional uh, questions or comments or thoughts during the presentation. And toward the end of it, we'll try to address as many of the questions as we can. Um, with that, if our panelists are ready, let me introduce you to them. We're really happy to have them here today. Uh, Dr. Crystal Chanel Truscott is a published playwright and scholar, a culture worker and facilitator, and founder of Progress Theater, a touring ensemble company using theater as anti-racism engagement to encourage cross-community consciousness. She received her BFA, MA, and PhD in performance studies from New York University. And as a playwright and director, she, created, she creates neo-spirituals, or acapella musicals using soul work, the generative method she developed from generations old African-American performance traditions. Her plays blend pop culture and academic conversations that span and straddle time between histories and the present to engage communities across race, class, gender, and spiritual identity. Dr. Truscott's scholarly research investigates oral traditions, cultural knowledge, and community practices as methodology for use by artists and practitioners, educators, universities and organizations seeking to offer inclusive, dynamic curricula and programming. Her research on representations of Muslims in pre-1950s American theater is featured in the Routledge Companion to African American Theater and Performance. Dr. Truscott is currently working on her book, Soul Work, Methodology from the Cultural Conservatory which traces the development, philosophy, and practical application of her method for training artists, building ensembles, and connecting communities. Her work has garnered recognition and grants from the Ford Foundation, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, National Foundation for the Advancement of the Arts, and the US Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund. She is Associate Professor of Performance Studies at Northwestern University. And Dr. Hussein Rashid has published academic works on the role of technology in teaching religion, Malcolm X, Gowali, intra-Muslim racism, Islam in comics, Muslims in film, and the role of arts in conflict mediation. He recently finished co-editing a book on Gamala Khan or Miss Marvel, Marvel Comics' first Muslim character to headline her own comic book. Dr. Rashid is currently co-editing a volume on Islam and popular culture and another volume on Islam in North America and co-authoring a cultural history of Muslims in America. He is currently affiliated with The New School, is a fellow with the American Muslim Civic Leadership Institute and is on the advisory boards of Anakaya Dance Theater and the Tannenbaum Center. Dr. Rashid talks regularly at churches, synagogues and mosques on Shi'i Muslim perspectives on anti-racism. He has a BA from Columbia University and a master's and a PhD from Harvard University. Um, and at the outset, we would like to note that the views of our speakers expressed during the course of this discussion are their own. So let's start. Uh, Drs. Trescott and Rashid, welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, <laughs> I am going to go ahead and throw some questions at you to frame the conversation, but please also feel free to respond to each other as you answer the questions. Um, so let's start. Uh, first, I want to think through the formation of history. So can you each talk a little bit about your own process of learning about how American Muslim history has been constructed so far and anything that you've learned that has surprised you or, or made you think differently about, uh, about this history? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and yalim with everyone. Thank you, Nosheen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Truscott, for joining us. Thank you for all the attendees for being here. Uh, I think for me, 
when I started doing research for my doctoral program, I was looking at uh, Kowali, a type of South Asian devotional literature. And I really actually wasn't as interested in Muslims in the United States. And I heard a talk by a scholar by the name of Sylvia Ann Diouf. Um, she has uh, several books out, but the one that I'm, I'm most uh, interested in is called Servants of Allah, about the early enslaved Muslims. But in this talk, she did this uh, tracing of the sound of the azan, the call to prayer, and the ways in which it, it sort of survived in enslaved Muslim communities and how that transformed and adapted as people were struggling with maintaining their culture, their religion, as though we can separate those two, but, but really trying to maintain that and how that sort of transformed over time. And that just opened my mind to ideas of cultural history, right? So that there's, we often tend to think of history as A, then B, then C. And really what Dr. Deuce talk and, and really got me going was thinking about, well, what are the things that we carry with us? How do we have this knowledge from the past that is always with us and always bringing with us wherever we are? And what does that look like in new environments and new places? And when it enters conversations with other people's histories, and what does that look like? So history not necessarily is linear, but history is really encompassing ways in which we view the world. So for me, that was an absolutely catalytic event in terms of doing my own work now on Muslims and US American popular culture. Yeah, um, salam alaikum, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and be a part of this conversation. So thanks for welcoming me. You know, I, I think I have three short stories that I'll share just about how I ended up really leaning into um, Muslim history and the process of learning about Muslims in America and American Muslim history. So I'll say one, it was just in a very um, personal and interpersonal space of my family and my community, not all of whom are Muslim, not even whom the majority are Muslim um, when I was growing up, but that there was always the presentation of Muslims in the context of um, the civil rights movement and the black power movements and that Muslims were always portrayed and represented as people who were freedom seeking, freedom fighting, um, and who were really already doing anti-racist work. Anti-racist work is, you know, is, is the language of our current moment. Um, but in, in the 60s, that wasn't used, but that was actually what was happening. And so that was my introduction was that, you know, it's the Muslims in America that call for justice, that call for equality, um, and that really, move the needle in terms of what it means for there to not be um, discrimination based on race or religion or all of these type of things. So that was one. So I, I, that was my introduction to understanding and even thinking about Muslims in America was the ways in which the community and the family that I grew up in presented them to me. Um, so, and then the second, I would say, um, well, I would, so part of that, um, is also just in like film and cinema. I remember I have a very strong childhood memory of watching the movie Roots. Um, and in Roots, the main character, Kunta Kinte, um, who was enslaved and taken from West Africa is portrayed as Muslim. And he, in the movie, like exemplifies all of the things that my community had said, right? He was freedom seeking. He was just, he was God fearing. He was um, persistent in trying to uh, hold on to the the culture that um, that uh, slavery was was telling him was less than or that that he shouldn't that he shouldn't practice so I was also being you know seeing um, evidence of that in in what I was consuming and what my you know community and family were um, permitting me to consume of pop culture so the next is that when I was in college I took a class um, by uh, Robin DG Kelly who is a you know very prominent uh, historian, African-American historian, American historian. And um, I remember, this was my freshman year in college, and he talked about the, he, he wrote a list of all of the, the ways in which slavery was justified by people who were really interested in upholding that system. And it was things like, um, well, these people deserve to be enslaved because they have no religion which ultimately meant not Christian, right? Um, these people deserve to be enslaved because they have no language, 
right? Which meant they don't speak English, right? <laughs> or, um, or that there was no um, written language or no culture, et cetera. So that the, the, the um, approach of people who, who were interested in slave holding was erasure. Right, was that, well, if nothing exists, then that justifies it. And then he went on to say, now here are all of the things that we know to be untrue. Um, as exemplified, the strongest examples that he gave were of enslaved Muslims, right? That enslaved Muslims, um, that there was documentation of the ways in which they practiced Islam in very, you know, in, in, in all of the ways that they could as enslaved people, that there was documentation of literacy, um, of, of writing in Arabic, of people who had studied and all of these things. So he, every um, justification for slavery, he presented an example of a life and a story and, and multiple lives and stories that contradicted that. And more often than not, the narratives that he was using to do that were Muslims. And so that was like, hmm, light bulb, you know, like that, that wow, is there, that is, proof is that easy, right? Like it's something that I already knew, but that, to have, the way that I understood what he was saying, like that no historian worth their salt could look at American history and the history um, of enslavement and not come across Muslims, right? And not come across Muslims who had survived and who had um, insisted upon their humanity um, and, and, and humanhood. And then the last story that I'll, I'll share um, is that when I was doing my research and I was really looking at spiritual diversity in, um, an, an, an American performance, and I kept stumbling across um, tropes about Muslims, and it was very interesting how clear the um, dichotomy was. So that when I was reading plays that were written in like the 1800s and maybe even late 1700s by white American playwrights, the stereotype of Muslim was very much the way that you see it today, right? That it was a violent person, that it was an irreligious person, that mostly male. Right, um, and that they were, you know, kind of given names, you know, like the sheikh or the sultan, you know, but they were somehow dominating and threatening the existence and purity of white womanhood and white male um, power, right? And then when I would read plays by African Americans that were written in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the depiction of Muslims would be totally different. Right, that it would be here are people who are um, who maintain their culture um, in America. Here are folks who were kings and queens. Here is literacy. There would be Timbuktu. I mean, it would just be these depictions were so night and day. And so that also really, um, you know, was is was an important uh, moment for me to think about. Like, what would it? What does it mean if anyone only has access to either story being told? Right, and what power or what clarifications can exist if we get to hear as many stories at, at the same time as possible to really have access to what is um, complex, right, and, and to what and, and whom erases um, the, the you know, evidence of the complexity of American lives, identity, and history. Yeah, that is, um, that is thorough. I, I'm struck by how much of a conversation it is, like the, the, the reasons for slavery and then the justification, or sorry, the justifications for slavery and then the refutals of those um, becomes this conversation. It reminds me back to, brings me back to what Dr. Rashid was saying about history not being linear. It is kind of this circular thing. Um, Dr. Rashid, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that before we move on to the next question. No, I, I mean, I thought that was a, a, a great um, introduction. I'm excited to hear what else Dr. Trust has got for us. Um, cool, right. And so you've each done um, work, as you've explained just now, in, in relearning and re-understanding history, and perhaps even making sure you, you get it from different places and different perspectives. Um, Dr. Truscott, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about Plantation Remix, which is one of, I think, your current projects, and then um, Dr. Rashid, I think you're working on a cultural history of Muslims in America. I'm curious about what what you've learned about how history is taught to us when we're learning it in formal and informal ways, and what for each of you has been the purpose of kind of reimagining these versions that we learn. Um, 
Yeah, um, so I'm gonna tr try to be as concise as possible in talking about Plantation Remix, but you know, you invite an artist to talk about work and we we're here. Um, but what I'll say is, um, so one is that this term remix, right, is very intentional and in that it's different from remake, right? If you think about songs, when, when, when another person remakes a person's song, they're really singing that person's song the way that they sung it, just using their voice. When someone does a remix, right, that it's more that they are taking information from that song and then they're trying to figure out how to do it their own way, how to make it better, how to fill in the holes, how to um, imagine what it could be or think about what's missing. So this idea of a remix is really kind of lives in the land if you think about academia of scholarship, about what it means to have read um, uh, uh, scholars of the past and quote them, not because you're necessarily agreeing with them or agreeing with everything that you're saying, but that you want to build on it, right? Or that you want to expand it. So this notion of plantation remix for me really in, in short became about um, reimagining the ways in which plantation tourism could be rehabilitated um, as a site to heal and connect communities as opposed to disconnect and, um, and really only tell one side of American history. So in the South, and I'm from, from Houston, Texas originally, um, but in various places in the South, less so Texas, but there is a, an industry of plantation tourism, right? Whereby um, people uh, go to tour former plantations, and I'll speak specifically about the, one of the tours that inspired me, um, because there's the largest of these tours exists in Mississippi, and it's actually called the pilgrimage, right? That is called the pilgrimage, whereby, and because Mississippi has the largest number of um, former plantations that are still intact and still owned by the descendants of the white descendants, right, of people who own those plantations. And what happened in the 1920s, 1930s is that the, those white descendants refurbished those plantations and every year would have gatherings and tourings where they would dress up like their ancestors in what I call like Disney princess, Southern belle, <laughs> you know, attire and, um, and give tours of the plantations and tours of the grounds. Um, as if though they were the glory days, right? Or that they were beautiful times. And would do this, you could go on the whole tour, a whole two hour tour, absent any recognition of um, the other identities and lives that lived on that plantation and made that lifestyle possible. So there would be no mention of Native Americans, right? And or that in order for this plantation to exist, people native to this land had been displaced and often murdered in mass numbers for that to exist. And then the second crime of in order for this lifestyle to exist, that there was unpaid and forced labor happening to uphold this Disney princess Southern Belle. So um, to this day, you can go on those tours and they're the same way. And you could go in and you see people dressed up um, in 19th century, sort of gone with the wind garb and give this tour completely erasing all of the other voices and histories that are evident um, and connected to that land. And what that does, unfortunately, is it has this single story mentality of saying, you know, the same things that I learned in that history class, right? That, here's the justification for these things without, you know, really thinking um, and, and showing the breadth and the, the, the comprehensive system that made that lifestyle possible. So Plantation Remix, or the dream of Plantation Remix, is to think about what would it mean to go on a tour of those plantations and to have to hear the multiple story of the land? What would it mean that if instead of entering the plantation and starting with, um, white slave owners that you start with indigenous people, that you start with native people telling you about what's sacred about the land and what happened um, to their community so that this plantation could be erected. What would happen if the people who survived enslavement on those, um, on those grounds were giving the tour? How would the tour look? What would it look differently? And then what would it mean to have all of those stories at the same time? Additionally, Plantation Remix really 
leans into this notion that there's really no American identity, um, past or present, right, across a multicultural range of experiences that is left uninformed by the systemic and sociocultural descendants of U.S. slavery, right? So U.S. slavery is the foundational system of the United States. And you're not going to be able to look at a, um, a present day law or movement or commentary, any of those things and not find those connections to slavery. And so the last thing that I'll say about Plantation Remix for now, unless you have questions or other folks have questions, one of those things is that there's a, a, a plantation um, that used to, I don't know if they still do it now, but it used to be that there were um, naturalization citizenship ceremonies held on the plantation, right? So that people who were, that was one of the, the events or services of that plantation. So that people who were becoming new citizens, um, beca and because this was the plantation of one of the founding fathers, right? That um, one of the white founding fathers that, that this is, you know, a person's entry into understanding what it means to be American needed to start there, that that would somehow make it more powerful. I mean, lots and lots of, 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 of questions and complexities, even in that notion. However, because I feel like a lot of people think, well, in learning about slavery um, and, and American history, that the black and white binary leaves out the entry point, right, of people who are um, new Americans, our first generation Americans, second gener generation Americans, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that begin exploring is how to tell that story. What does it mean for people to enter into um, the middle of a history, right, or a conversation that's already fraught with tension and not get a great deal of context? So one of the pebbles that I'll say that um, I'm, you know, researching and tracing, you know, performatively in Plantation Remix is this idea of the Reconstruction Amendments, right, which were, you know, and, and I, I don't want to say this definitively because I'm not 100% sure about it now, but as I understand it, there have been no amendments to the Constitution since then right, since those Reconstruction Amendments. And the Reconstruction Amendments took place right after the Civil War. And they are Amendments 13, 14, and 15. So they happened right after the ending of slavery because the ending of slavery called for amendments to the Constitution because the Constitution did not include everyone who was living in the United States. And so you have the 13th Amendment with, which abolishes slavery, the 14th Amendment which establishes um, uh, citizenship and what citizenship is and what citizenship means. And then the 15th Amendment that is about voting, right? And that citizens have the right to vote. So these conversations that we're having today, even about citizenship, um, about voting, they cannot be had outside of the context of understanding those amendments, right? Because those amendments are still the ones that are cited um, and, 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 and used for all of these things. And so then if we jump even to things like um, the uh, uh, civil, civil rights movement, right? That the 14th Amendment really was the first to think about this idea of, of citizenship and equal protection under the law, right? Or what, we, what was uh, addressed in the civil rights movement of 1964 as not being able to discriminate on anybody. For, uh, um, discriminate against people on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin. That Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, the, the foundation for that was the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, you know, in, was in, in response to the ending of slavery. So all of that connects. And then if you go even further, that during the Civil Rights, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1964 came out of the civil rights movement, which was building around what it meant to not discriminate and prior to language around who could immigrate, who could, you know, who would become a citizen, could become a citizen, and even like unspoken, you know, practices of discrimination around which countries were deemed okay to immigrate from, immigrate from, and for people to become a citizen, that, that those amendments, again, directly tied back to, excuse me, those civil rights acts directly tied back to the Reconstruction Amendments are the things that gave justification that um, welcomed a new wave of immigration 
from across the world and from a large part of the Muslim world into the United States. So I know I, I warned you before that I could go down a rabbit hole, but the idea of, 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 of exploring this through performance, right, in a way that puts people into conversation to say, because it's a bold statement to say that there's no US identity that's disconnected from the systemic descendants of slavery, but when people can be immersed in saying, you know, kind of following all of the steps that lead back to this um, the plantation politics, right? That we're still in many ways trying to heal from. I think that that oftentimes can open up um, a great deal of conversation, right? And more understanding. And if anything, hopefully, like the dream is more connection, right? In really doing the work that says um, that wants um, the United States to practice what it preaches, for lack of a better word. Yeah, so it sounds like it's, it's much more, it's much less a reimagining of history um, and much more a, almost like a reprioritization of what we're forgetting about history or what we just don't think about. Sure, because it's, it's not a reimagining, we don't have to imagine it, it happened, right? Like these things are real. What we are reimagining is, is the way in which the public has access to shared history, right? That we're saying these sites or any historical site, right? Be it a monument, be it, you know, um, a reservation land or a holy land for Native Americans, be it a plantation site, that, that there has been, or a lot of people either have no information about those sites or they have a single story information about that site that's told from the perspective of justifying, right, um, why things are the way they are, as opposed to the story that says, you know, what if I could look at it from the perspective and lens of everyone that it impacted, everyone who was alive then, and then all of the impacts that happened thereafter that affect our lives today, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I'm really struck by the image of like a citizenship um, ceremony happening on a plantation and just all of the metaphors that includes. Um, Dr. Rashid, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle that as well? Question. Yeah, so first I want to start out by thanking Dr. Trotscott for reminding me I forgot the land acknowledgement. I'm in New York City on land that is traditionally stewarded by the Lenape people. Um, and if you're interested in finding out how to support them and their work, uh, if you look up the Delaware Nation Foundation, uh, that's the active group for the Lenape people here. Um, so uh, I think what uh, no, Sheen, you just, in your follow-up question said, is exactly how I would approach this. I, I think you'll find that Dr. Truscott and I have very similar uh, intellectual approaches to the work we do. So for me, it's not reimagining history. It's about whose voices do we center. So um, in this book, I'm co-authoring with my dear friend and uh, grad school colleague, Precious Rashid the Muhammad. You know, we start with this phrase that's in the Constitution. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, well, okay, if we start with the premise that all men are created equal, what happened to the women? And then we know enslavement, you know, slavery is happening. So what happens to the enslaved people? Are they not equal? So already we see a gender issue there. We see a, a racial issue there. Um, we can look at the class issue because it's really landholding men who are considered equal. Um, and then there's a certain assumption about religion, that these people are Protestants, that they're heterosexual, uh, so that there's all sorts of implications about how there's this ideal that we say, oh, look at this great statement we have. But even in that statement, we can have these criticisms of, in fact, how, how the nation was founded and continues to exist. And I think a lot of what I'm trying to do in, in that book is thinking through with Precious, how is the United States, if we think about all these identities that are excluded, how do we think about the United States as a country defining itself not so much aspirationally, but in opposition to blackness and in opposition to Islam? Because everybody makes a big deal about, let's say, Thomas Jefferson owning a Quran, which is fantastic. It's true. He owns it. But it really seems the ways in which the Quran and Muslimness was utilized was to try to say, they're the big boogeyman over there. How can we be better than that? Right? And so, and now all of a sudden, it's like, now you actually have Muslims here. What do we do? But you actually had Muslims in the country then as well, right? George Washington, we know, had at least two Muslim people that he kept enslaved, Fatima and little Fatima. You don't get any more obvious than that. So how do we start coming forward with these stories? Uh, not because, as Dr. Truska said, the history didn't happen. We don't need to imagine this. 
but how do we change the perspective of the history so we can actually think about ourselves more inclusively? You know, and if I, if I put on my religion hat for a second, right? Uh, my theological hat rather, we talk about toba, repentance, but repentance isn't just seeking forgiveness, right? It's turning away from a behavior that is detrimental, that is harmful into something that is better. But if you don't know the behavior that's harmful, how do you turn away from it to the thing that is better, right? So to honestly take into thinking about what this country could be in its most idyllic form, we need to face honestly what's happened in the past so we can turn from it, right? And say, this will not happen again, rather than happening again and again. Uh, so for me, I think that's, that's part of the conversation. And what this is, is always trying to figure out what are the conversations that are happening? So as a scholar, one of the best bits of advice I ever got from a, a writing seminar I attended was that whenever I'm writing, I'm entering into a scholarly conversation. So I need to find out what's being said and what do I want to add to that conversation. And I've taken that perspective, I think, to trying to understand history and trying to understand what role do different communities have in these histories. So I think about the fact uh, that there is a history in this country of slavery. And Dr. Truscott said, and I'm paraphrasing here, I couldn't quite get it, but something along the lines of, there is no US identity that is not impacted by US slavery, right? That, that's a conversation that's happening in this country. And when I think about my own family, right? They came from Tanzania. I was born and uh, raised here in New York. Uh, my parents came from Tanzania. My family, most of my family came from Tanzania. And before that, obviously multi-generations back from South Asia. Right, these are histories of countries, of the people who were alive in my lifetime, histories of colonization, right? And that's a different type of mentality that comes in. And so that's a conversation that, that my elders have and are bringing into conversations here in the United States. And so we have to think deeply about what happens when these two conversations come into mind. Now, now, arguably, the conversation of colonization and the conversations around slavery are cousins, right? I mean, they're not unrelated, uh, but they're very different and they look very different in different places. So how do we understand that we, how do I understand myself as coming in with the conversations that I'm carrying from my family, from my elders, Right? And how do I enter into a conversation that's been happening in this country since 1619? Right? And how do those become overlapping conversations? How do they become ways, and I think Dr. Truscott talked about freedom fighting, but how do they become complementary conversations for a broader ethic of equity and, and freedom? And for me, that, that's an important thing. And, and as I'm saying this, you know, I think we also have to look at our religious tradition, again, putting on the theological cap. Right, I think about Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. When he leads his people out of enslavement, they're wandering for 40 years. And the traditional commentaries hold that that's because you needed generations to let go of this conversation of enslavement that had ended. But that conversation of enslavement hasn't ended in this country. The conversation of colonization hasn't ended for many of uh, the immigrants who are coming in. So how do you have these ongoing conversations and try to thread something new? And on that note, I, I just, I, I, I want to think about this, is I also am very cautious of, I don't want to say that this is a generational issue, that it gets better across generations. It doesn't. When we look at attitudes and polling on attitudes on race in the United States, there is consistently across generations, a continuous hum of explicit racism. And we have systematic racist, uh, issues of race that we have to deal with. And I will not, I absolutely will not dishonor my elders. Because if I believe that there is something about justice that I want to stand for today, it's because of that conversation I was in because of them, right? So we may not speak the same language, but I didn't come out of this new and fresh. I came at this because of them. So how do I have, how do I develop a shared language with them that, that has them engage in a conversation, right? Um, 
And that's, again, it's not intergenerational. How do I do it with my peers who also don't understand the conversations that we're walking into? So I, I think it's really important to understand that as individuals, we are always part of conversations. We are walking into conversations. We are walking with conversations. And it is incumbent on us to listen before we decide we can contribute. That's fair. And I think you both hit upon the point that I think when Dr. Truscott said there is no American identity that is untouched by slavery, there is an acknowledgement that has to happen that um, the effects of the consequences of slavery are still in play today. And you can't, you can't really get that context without um, acknowledging that and owning that and knowing that. So I appreciate the, um, I appreciate saying that out loud. I think that's important. And, and I would just say, and, and, and the, the other side of that coin is also true, which is that we are also the beneficiaries. Everyone is the beneficiary of people who fought against enslavement, of people who fought um, during uh, Reconstruction and civil rights movements. So, you know, um, and, and these are all movements that were largely, you know, that were led by African-Americans, right? But that in the same way that we are not, none of us are exempt from the destructive systemic um, descendants of the system of slavery, that we are also um, beneficiaries of people who have been trying to correct and, and have these conversations and um, engage progress in our country as well, whether we acknowledge it or not. You know, I mean, like in, in, inherent in, in the, the breadcrumbs that I, you know, um, drew yeah. from the Reconstruction Amendments to our current conversations about um, voting, vote, voter suppression and, and immigration and all of these things. So there is, um, you know, there, there's sunshine and shade in the story, right? And that I think that we always have to make sure that as we are challenging the shade that we also uplift the sunshine, right? And that we want to make sure that we are a part of understanding that legacy too, right? So that we can join in it and say, gosh, this is what we've learned. What can we add to it? What can we bring forward in the same way that as Dr. Rashid said, that we can look back and say never again to the shade, right? Like we won't do that, but this is what we will do. And or this is how we'll do it better as well. I appreciate and, and, you calling the sunshine. Sorry about all yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think along those lines, and I want to be very careful here, I am not suggesting brown savior complex, right? But we also have moments of solidarity across communities historically as well. We can look at Muhammad Sadiq and the Ahmadi community in the 19th century. We can look at Muhammad Dus Ali and Mark, and working with, uh, who's of Egyptian descent, working with Marcus Garvey uh, and the UNNIA. Um, you know, we have, we know that uh, we tend to talk a lot about Malcolm's pilgrimage, Malcolm X's pilgrimage to Mecca. But we also know that he had a Pakistani friend, he had Iranian friends, right? So that there's a, a sense. And I have written a lot of public essays about the fact that as an American Muslim, a Shia American Muslim, that to me, the role model of how do we live our ethics in this country, our Shia ethics as taught by Imam Ali, alayhi salam, are manifested by Malcolm X for me because it's, it's this ethical worldview that is put into action, not for the benefit of a select group of people, but for all people. And it's a, a combination of rhetoric and physical action, right? So for me, that is that is my personal exemplar of how do we how do we engage with this? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm going to bring things uh, back to the point a little bit, and I also want to um, just point out that we have about 11 minutes before I'm supposed to shift it over to audience questions. So just a heads up on that. Um, okay, so. For each of you, what does being a Muslim in America look like today? And how does, so we've talked a little bit about the historical Muslim experiences. Um, how does that shape the understanding of Islam and Muslims today for, for each of you? I don't think, and this is the bias of the book I've mentioned, <laughs> but I don't think you can understand U.S. American history without understanding how the country engages with its Muslims. From Jefferson saying, we should be able to have a Muslim elected to office because he didn't think it would ever be possible, but establishing that actually now as a benchmark we should strive for, right? To town names in the United States like Mecca, Medina, Allah, Arizona, al Qaeda, Iowa, right? I mean, these are the ways in which this country is shaped in its interaction with Muslims real and imagined. 
you have architecture, Richmond, Virginia, you have the landmark theater, which looks like a giant mosque. You have uh, city centers, you know, these old Shriner lodges, Chicago, the Bloomingdale's on Wabash and Ohio, right? Looks that way for a particular reason. Um, and, and so how do we understand US American history without understanding its fascination with what it means to be Muslim, real and imagined? And then how do we understand popular culture around us without thinking about Muslims? And I come back to Sylvia and Dio's uh, argument that if the azan is a particular sound that is preserved culturally and gives rise to what we think the slave spiritual sounded like, and that gives rise to blues and to jazz and then to R&B, and, and I think hip hop is a, a different sort of intervention, but all of that, you cannot engage with popular culture in this country without understanding that it's due first and foremost primarily to black communities in this country and that Muslims had a disproportionate impact even within that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would just add, you reminded me of, you know, and this is also a part of my scholarly research um, in, in the breadcrumb that I feel like youth kind of laid out in looking from when I went searching for evidences of spiritual diversity um, in American culture um, that, I mean, she jumps to the blues, but I would also say that you're going to find elements of West African Islamic influence in gospel music. Um, I often say, say to people that the Black church, as it was formed during the time of slavery, is probably the first multi-faith in, in, interfaith institution in America because people who were enslaved from all parts of West Africa, various religions, when they got here, they were only allowed to practice one right, or ostensibly practice one, right? So, but you still had all of these people believing what they believed worshiping together. And so what you find in the religion of people who were enslaved is that um, there are a range of expression, right? And one of the ways that, that Muslims showed up, I mean, there's so many examples of the ways in which Muslims showed up because the, the field spirituals, um, do, you know, are, are directly connected to what became gospel music. Um, but that in really literal ways, so that you can find churches built throughout the South by formerly enslaved people that are built facing Mecca, um, that you find Arabic script on the back of pews that was written by people who were enslaved. So people who were constantly trying to assert, right, their um, belief systems, their humanity, their presence in, in all manner um, in all manner of ways. So, I mean, absolutely, I agree with you, you know, that there's you really just can't look at United States history and not engage Muslim American history. You know, that is a part of, of, the, um, of how the United States became the United States, right? And how culture moves through um, this land. The other thought that, that I had, and I'm gonna try to be brief on this, I know we're, we're running low on time, but I was just really struck um, by, by Dr. Rashid's you know, statement about the cousins of colonization and slavery. Um, and another one of my mentors in Gugi Watiango, who is a scholar from uh, Kenya in, in East Africa, wrote a book called Decolonizing the Mind, and I'm paraphrasing. But one of the things that he asserts is that colonization is most successful when it persists even in the absence of the colonizer. Right, and so that the colonizer does not have to be present. The people who have been colonized end up perpetuating the systems, the thinking um, without the colonizer being present. And one of those things for me that exists that I find make colonization and slavery cousins, but that also I think give people coming from these legacies a way to join into conversations together and a way that people have joined in conversations together through some of the examples that Dr. Rishi gave but is that it colonization and slavery both present these false narratives of superiority and false narratives of inferiority. And when they are successful, people actually internalize these false narratives of superiority and false narratives of inferiority, right? And so, and, and then, I mean, in thinking about sacred tradition and principles of Islam, this idea of superior or inferior would really only be judged in relationship to someone's observance of, of God, right? Or a faith or their practice of faith. But what these systems do is say that that's not what makes someone superior or inferior, that it becomes all of these superficial things and that when people internalize them, 
right? Um, it's either superiority or inferiority because they're both really you know, dangerous and necessary to make these systems work when people internalize them, that that in turn um, impacts the way that people treat each other, right? Which is why you don't need the presence of the colonizer or the presence of the person who is invested in enslavement. If someone has internalized inferiority um, again, and that they are inferior to someone, but that they simultaneously internalize, well, at least I'm superior to this other <laughs> individual, you know, that then the spokes, you know, kind of keep going in ways that um, in when, when, when mentalities uh, left from colonization and slavery meet that have people enacting these narratives, right, um, in ways that if we disrupt them would actually bring people together. Right, um, and, and, to, and create a, a larger mass of folks that could call for what does it mean to, to disconnect from those falsehoods, right? And to show up in a way that says equality, right? Equality would, has to mean the absolution of all of those narratives, those false narratives and false belief systems of superiority and inferiority. I know that is not a direct address to your question, but I just wanted to say um, that I just think that that's one of the ways in which um, people who come from these, uh, from, from histories of enslavement and histories of colonization, that we know those systems well and that we've challenged them in our, in our own communities and in our own spaces, right? And yet, that sometimes the struggle that happens is that when people get together across communities, they end up reenacting, right? These same false narratives towards each other, even in the absence of the colonizer, or even in the absence of people, you know, who are were proponents of enslavement or their descendants. Yeah, that's, um, that brings me back, I think, to what you said earlier. I think it was you that said it earlier where, or it might've been Dr. Rashid, but so, someone stepping into a conversation that's already happening, um, if that conversation is hierarchical and you feel like you're trying to survive, you're just gonna go along with it. And um, that can recreate these cycles of violence and, and, and hierarchy. So um, yeah, that's a lot, there's a lot to think about there. Um, thank you for that, both of you. And um, I have one more question that I think I'm just gonna try to power through and then we'll go to audience questions. Is that okay? Yeah, all right, so quickly, can, can you each talk about, um, sorry, just a few ways that Islam and American Muslims have impacted America and a few ways that America and the systems here have impacted the practice of Islam? And I know there's probably a million, but maybe just a few that stand out to you. So I, I've talked a little bit about music, place names, architecture, I, I think in terms of how Muslims have sort of impacted this country. Um, I think the flip side is how the state, the, the nation state of the United States has affected the way uh, Muslims understand their faith is, you know, I think that there has been a, a, a push to formalize a particular understanding of what it means to be Muslim, right? So you have these interfaith panels and you have the rabbi, the priest and the imam, but the imams don't function for Sunni Muslims in the same way that they do for rabbis and priests. And of course, Shi'i communities have a different leadership structure where the imam is not the person actually you're trying to bring in. Um, and, and so there's a, we're, we're trying to fit into this mold of what the state wants us to function as. That's cultural. I think more formally, um, you know, the state has uh, very strict rules about charitable giving and organizational structures. And I think that really impacts the ways in which we organize and structure um, our communities. And we're very conscious of where our money goes, um, you know, uh, sometimes for the better, because there's a certain type of professionalization that that implies. And sometimes it's sort of like in a, in a you know, we're talking a lot about mutual aid in this present moment, right? But when you think about what things like zakat, sadaqah, khums, all these things you're supposed to do, those were mutual, those are the original mutual aid, right? They were meant to be taken from the community, invested back into the community. Um, and, and I think now we're looking for more formal, is this a 501c3 where I can direct my money? Uh, and so I think those are ways in which it's, you know, we're falling into, I don't want to say we're giving up the ethic of giving, but I think we're giving up the ethic of the impact of giving, right? And we're looking for a type of recognition that I think a lot of this type of giving 
historically has not been part of it. You know, the idea was that you gave with being anonymous about it. And now it's sort of like, I need some recognition for this for tax purposes or community purposes, whatever it is. So I think, again, the state is having an impact in, in places like that. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was one of the things that I love about um, Islam and and about expressions of Islam, I would say, you know, um, in America is the, in the United States is the range of expression. Um, and I think, and I really love that thinking about the United States as a very unique space where one can experience a range of cultural expressions of Islam and Muslim identity kind of within one country, right? Oftentimes I think when people think of, um, the Muslim world or if folks travel to the Muslim world, um, they're engaging cultures and, and Islamic culture um, that is very, uh, that's very place-based and culture-based on, on a single culture or a single identity, right? And it's one of the things that I kind of love. I love that I can travel to various places in the Muslim world and I can pray, you know, in various places because that's the same, but that there's so many cultural expressions that are different depending on whether I'm in Malaysia, whether I'm in Senegal, whether I'm in Turkey, right? That I'm also engaging with this culture and that Islam um, does not um, manifest by creating a monolithic culture everywhere that Islam spreads, right? That there is this belief system and that there is an array of expressions. And I feel like the United States is very unique in that you don't have to travel in order to get that experience. Um, you know, that, that there can be uh, the experience of this, this range of expression. So one, I think that that range of expression and, and of culture from the beginning, as we've been saying, has impacted American culture or, you know, culture in the United States. But I also think that it has impacted what we are coming to understand and, and grapple with trying to define as Muslim Americanness, right? Um, because included in that is not, um, it's, it's not a monolith by any sense, right? Um, and yet that there is a community that still has a shared and vested interest across culture, across all of these things that, that are, fall under the umbrella of being Muslim American or American Muslim. And so um, that I feel like is one of the kind of uh, exciting processes, right? That is happening is that we have access at, um, that there's the opportunity to be an example of what it means to have uh, shared uh, identity and values and then also particularities um, of culture and expression and that all of the above can be included and that all of the above can apply. Awesome, thank you. Um, thanks for, thanks for uh, sticking to time. I mean, we're all, we're all doing our best on time. Um, I'm going to move to the audience questions, and I'm going to start with, um, um, okay, first audience question. Does Dr. Truscott have any examples of the language being used about Muslims in the plays and culture of the time? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll give... I'll give one and mainly because I can also point you to where you can read more about it <laughs> and see it. So one of the first that I stumbled upon is was a play written by W.E.B. Du Bois in 1930 called The Star of Ethiopia. Yeah. And um, in the play, so at the time, uh, the, there, were, there was a phenomenon called pageant plays, right, that every identity in um, the United States would sort of put on and perform as a way of showing pride in their heritage, right, or their culture, so that um, people of Irish descent would have a pageant play, right, that uh, people of Asian descent would have a pageant play. Um, there were even some indigenous pageant plays and um, Italian pageant plays, Jewish pageant plays, and this is at the 19th century and and in the early 1900s. And so Du Bois wrote this pageant play um, as a um, representation of African American history and culture. And he framed it by saying there are um, five gifts of the Negro to the world, right? Um, and every scene was a different gift. And so there would be um, the gift of music, right? Um, there would be the gift of iron. Um, and the third scene is the gift of faith. 
And in talking about the gift of faith, um, Du Bois names Islam. And the scene unfolds um, by uh, depicting the empires of uh, Mansa Musa in West Africa. Um, and in depictions of West African Muslims um, fighting against colonization and fighting against enslavement. Um, and that, and then it shows, you know, those descendants sort of coming to America and upholding this faith as a, um, as one of the tools and resources that people use to survive, right? So, and this was, and these pageant plays, I mean, they were huge. This play took place at, um, oh, now I can't think of the, the name of the opera hall, the big, this is, this is a big opera hall in New York. Dr. Roger, maybe you can help me. I don't know why it's leaving my mind right now. Was uh, it at the Met? Um, the Metropolitan? Is there another? It might have been that. I'll 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 look it up yeah. <laughs> and then come back. But it's 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 very well known. So um, it's it's escaping me right now. But um, and over like eight hundred people attend. Right, there were over three hundred people in the cast. And this was not just for Du Bois' pageant play. That's just that pageant plays were the pop culture concerts of the time. Um, um, but these were huge. And Duke Ellington was in attendance at that play, you know, um, as a teenager, you know, who, you know, Dr. Rashid has already talked about the influences of Islam and jazz and all of these types of things. But yeah, so that's one, probably one of the most famous, that play in and of itself is in, is in an anthology by James Hatch and Ted Shine on African American theater. And I also wrote a piece on this in the Rutledge anthology, um, Rutledge companion to African American theater um, and performance. Gotcha. Thank you. We, we will be sending, I think we are going to be sending out some resources later on for those who registered. So we'll try to include that in there. Um, thanks. Uh, and then we, we have some time. So um, here's another question for both of you. Since you're both in the teaching profession, um, to some extent, how do you suggest teaching history in school or in um, religious communities to youth? What can we do to ensure that that erasure is not happening in our school systems? You know, I, I think part of what I struggle with uh, in getting university students who are just fresh out of high school, and this is not a critique of my students, I think it's more a commentary on things uh, like the Common Core that really have a lot of our students working towards a test rather than coming in with the ability to think critically, right? So even in my class, my intro to Islam class, for example, 14 weeks, two sessions, a week. So I meet with them, let's say, 28 times over the course of the semester if they're there for every class. There's only so much I can cover of 1400 years of history and a quarter of the world's population. I always have to make decisions. But for me, the, the success is, have I equipped my students to continue to ask questions? Right? I, I mean, to me, that's what a good education should do is here's some information, here's some knowledge, here's ways to think about it, but now go ask your own questions. I'm telling you questions people have answered, go and now ask the next set of questions, go ask better questions. What are we missing? You know, what do we need to ask about? What are the, who are the voices we're not hearing? You know, um, and, and again, I think for me, Islamic studies is a very exciting place right now. Islam in America is a very exciting place right now because there's so many disciplines at work and there's so many great questions being asked. Um, you know, I think about um, the Africana perspective that's being brought in by people like Edward Curtis, um, uh, who has a, a really lovely couple of uh, really great books on uh, Muslims in America. Um, I think about Sylvia Chan Mullick, who's asking questions about race and gender, uh, whose new book, Being Muslim, uh, came out last year. Um, Suad Abdul Kabir's book on New Muslim Cool, uh, which looks at culture and race and, and some of the questions we're asking here about immigrant communities versus black communities and how, what is that interaction as it relates to representations of Islam. So for me, it's not necessarily changing what is taught, it's about how it's taught so that we're always inviting students to continue. And I'm going to use this word again, continue the conversation once the class is over, because I feel like classes we're treating as total experiences. This is the totality of the conversation rather than no, here's a part of the conversation, go forth and, get, and engage with it more. Mm 
Yes, I would absolutely agree. Um, before I answer this question, I just want to say it's Lincoln Center. I couldn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> this really was. I had every other, um, you know, site in my head, but I couldn't remember Lincoln Center. But Lincoln Center in New York is where Star of Ethiopia premiered. Um, and then went on to tour four other cities in the United States, DC and Philadelphia included. So I totally agree. Um, I would add to the how it's taught in saying that I think simultaneity is important. I really believe that history should not be, can't be fully understood and learned when it's compartmentalized, right? But understanding what was happening in the United States to um, make any system thrive means having to look at the experiences of all of the identities involved, right? And so that there should be a, as this was happening for native communities, this is what was happening in white communities, this is what was happening in African American communities, this was happening in Japanese, you know, um, American communities, like to understand that all of these, um, happenings and actions and occurrences are, 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 are dominoes, they are a tug of war, they are seesaws, they are all impacted um, by each other. And that the moment that is happening is not happening exclusive you know, um, to, to any community, right? That every community is impacted um, by, by what happens, right? And then, and, and by what occurs. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm a really big proponent of this simultaneity of understanding that. The other thing is that I feel like it's, um, there is, you know, I, there's a theater artist, Luis Valdez, who is the founder of Teatro Campesino, who has this quote that I really love that says, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. And one of the ways that I um, embrace that quote is this idea that when a person um, can enter into a space with the fullness of their identity, right, that they are more equipped to engage the fullness of identity of everyone else in that space, right? And so as specifically and wholeheartedly as um, most of us, certainly as I would want to represent who I am and my family's history and all of the complexities and nuances of it and my community's history, like that type of investment and being able to bring in all of who I am and the shoulders on which I stand into a room um, invites, I feel like, others to bring in the fullness of who they are and the shoulders on which they stand, but that it also in equips us with that level of trust and care to say, great, now all of our stories and histories can exist in the same room at the same time, and they should, right? And this way, which um, Dr. Rashi mentioned earlier, of what it means to enter in the fullness of who you are and then listen, right? To embrace and, and absorb all of the ways that the fullness of all of these histories and identities are in conversation with your own. So um, making history and the learning of history not as something that is to be um, in the rearview mirror, but to see ourselves in this current moment that we are the embodiment of all of the things that led up to it, right? And so that the more that we can make space for how full and complicated and, um, and not easy, right? Like a lot of those, you know, um, legacies and conversations are to have that the better we are, at, at, um, I feel the better we become at being comfortable naming and sharing all of those stories and histories together to hopefully the dream in my mind is the point that we can't really engage history or engage the story of the United States without mentioning multiple story and multiple identity and multiple entry points like that there, 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 there just becomes no other way to do it that we've completely erased right this um, colonized and descendant of slavery version of history that says here's how to learn history Right, and then here are all of your electives that you can take if you so choose. And instead of that, that we are introduced to like the big mass that we have to um, interrogate together. That's great, and I think just you know all of us are students, and it so much of what you both said resonated because it requires a confidence in the wholeness of yourself, but then also um, you know a minimizing of ego so that you can open your mind and learn about other experiences and believe them to be true. Uh, and that's hard to do. Um, we have some more uh, audience questions, so I'm going to go through those. Um, 
For projects like Plantation Remix, which are so strongly place-based, to deconstruct the stories that we are told about that place and how it fits in our view of history, do you use any techniques or mechanisms to bring in narratives that happened in different places and times into the performance? Um, and then I think a, just a follow-up is what role can narratives and stories play in shaping our understandings of Muslims in America? Yeah, um, so I think the, the progress, uh, excuse me, Plantation Remix is in development. Um, and um, part of the developmental process is in being in call and response with various communities, right? About what it would mean for this play to move through a site that they have either public or communal stewardship of, either by proximity or by direct um, connection. But um, so there is absolutely the intention to honor the specifics of a given site, which means that there is an, an element and a chunk of Plantation Remix that changes at every site <laughs> because in order to honor that right there's also a chunk of, of plantation remix that's the same at every site because what we're looking at is systems right and sort of these larger um kinds of conversation and then there's a chunk of of plantation remix that is fully informed by the presence of that particular audience on that given day and um the kinds of, of conversations and or performance interventions that happen as a result of who's in the room then, right? Um, one of the techniques in using that is a story circle technique that was uh, started by the Free Southern Theater during the Civil Rights Movement um, that became Junebuck Theater that was based out of New Orleans. And it is was a technique that was used to facilitate conversation and listening between communities that have a violent history um, and to have them be in the same space and be in conversation and then ultimately um, over time, right, begin to have um, performance and changes in behaviors in terms of the way that the communities work. So it's a structured facilitation process that sort of, sort of leads that conversation. Additionally, um, as you, when you read my, my bio, I have a, a technique and a method that I call soul work um, that is really also rooted in this idea of what does it mean to invite the fullness of everyone that's in the room? And what does it mean to have those types of interventions um, be present in the way that they can only be present based on uh, who's there? So it, it, it infuses the um, sort of spontaneity of story and performance based on who's there and combines it with kind of what's already planned in the ways that we want to make sure we're honoring that specific site and then the ways in which we are sharing about systems. The other thing that I'll say is that one of my first um, site visits for Plantation Remix actually happened in Hawaii. Um, which has, you know, even though it's a part of the United States, you know, has a very specific history in terms of Native Hawaiians and in terms of um, the, you know, populations that were colonized and basically put in indentured servitude um, plantations there. Um, specifically like a heavily, you know, heavy Filipino uh, population and Malaysian population. And so what we found is that the particularities of a site people sometimes assume that the particularities will disconnect folks, but actually it's the particularities of a site that invite the universal experience, right? So that, that you had people from various parts of the world at, on, the, on the site of these Hawaiian plantations that were able to bring in stories from their communities and their histories just by leaning into the specifics of that site. And I found the same thing in various site visits here on the mainland of the United States is that when people are there, the particularities are actually not um, a deterrent. The particularities are an invitation, right? So that we can bring in um, and see again, like all of the, you know, this is not a great phrase right now, but all of like the oppressive cousins <laughs> and the way, because, you know, oppression is really not unique. You know, they're the same tactics and the same things that are used to oppress people in various places. I mean, there's, 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 it's, it's not a unique thing. And so when people share those particular stories that it really does open up this universal lens through which people um, invest in what it means to assert the humanity of people that are like themselves and people that are not like themselves. 
Oh. I uh, obviously can't talk about Plantation Remix, but I'm going to take the second part of the question about narratives. Um, and, I, and I really want to build a little bit on what Tr Dr. Truscott was saying um, as she was talking about, uh, you know, oppression uses the same sorts of tactics. I have a book on my to read list, which makes the argument that Nazi laws, anti-Semitic laws passed during the Nazi regime were based on America's racial segregation laws. Right, so that we can see the ways in which these these things sort of flow, because there are only so many ways you can oppress people, uh, right? I mean, one could arguably say this is kind of what Pharaoh was doing. Is it really that different? Because how many different ways can you do it? Uh, and I think the idea of particularity of narrative is so important, right? We we love a good book or a good movie because it sits in a place, it tells a story that we then imagine ourselves in or around. Um, and then we start making connections with this story and that story and this story and that's, and, and we make those constellations of stories, you know? And for me, the narrative question, I don't want to prove my humanity. And I, there's this great Toni Morrison quote, and I'm so bad at doing it, but you know, the idea that trying to prove our humanity is a distraction. No matter what we do, the, the bar will always be shifted. So if we say, uh, Muslims have no religion and we prove we have religion, well, Muslims don't have a religion that promotes peace. Oh, well, we have a religion that promotes peace. Oh, well, you're not fair to women, right? And so those bars are always shifting without any self-reflexivity coming back. Uh, you know, well, what about the culture in which you sit, right? So that power dynamic comes into play. Um, and so the narratives I'm really interested in are the narratives that allow me as a Muslim to tell the stories of Muslims in a way that Muslims would recognize and that they would find joy in. And so I worked on a, a project several years ago for the Children's Museum of Manhattan uh, called America to Zanzibar, Muslim Cultures Near and Far. And the question was, well, all these parents are coming in with questions uh, about what it means to be Muslim. Uh, I said, but who's your clientele? And they said, oh, well, our target audience is the kids. I said, so how are your kids gonna find joy? And how would Muslim kids find joy in your museum? That's what you do with every other. And then, you know, again, to their credit, that's how they were thinking, but they were caught up in adult thinking. And we were able to create this exhibit that traveled the country for two years. Uh, uh, Dr. Truscott and I are advising on an opera at the Spoleto Festival that will premiere, it was supposed to premiere this year, uh, will hopefully premiere next year uh, on Omar ibn Sayyid and his autobiography, uh, autobiography of an enslaved uh, Muslim man uh, and the struggles that he went through. Um, and our goal has really been, how do we tell Omar's story rather than how people were functioning as intermediaries to Omar's story, right? How do we honor what he thought was important? Uh, uh, there's a, another project I'm working on, on, um, and I, I mentioned these as projects because I think it's important to say, these are the things that bring me joy because I think it's a way for us to tell the story with a, I'm working on a project on the, with the National Jazz Museum in Harlem about Muslims and jazz, but very particularly through the lens of Harlem. Right, so this thing is what brings us joy in Harlem that we can imagine the musicians we're talking about we're also finding joy in, right? So that it becomes a celebration of life and culture rather than a response to somebody else saying, prove to us you are worthy of life and culture. Um, that's really cool. I'm very excited about the jazz thing, that's awesome. Um, all right, I think I'm gonna just go for one more question. We have like a minute, but it's probably okay. Um, how are Muslims and their communities in the US working together today in the interest of Muslim unity? You can't both be silent. I, you know, there's so many ways I think we could each answer that. Um, you know, I, I don't know what Muslim unity means in this context. Uh, I, I don't know if we will ever get a unified Muslim voice. And to me, that's not a problem. That's a blessing, right? We don't want to speak with one voice necessarily, because I think it diminishes what it is our religion offers us, and it diminishes what our own particularities are. I think that how do we get to, how, what are we doing to generate respect amongst ourselves and work together where it makes sense to work together, I think is a more interesting question. So 
Um, you know, Dr. Truscott and I, as I mentioned, we're, we are doing this, um, uh, advising on this this opera. Uh, but there are a couple of other projects, uh, uh, cultural pro uh, projects that we're working on together. Um, there are communities, I think you mentioned in my bio that I'm part of this group called the American Muslim Civic Leadership Institute, which brings together Muslims of all sorts of varieties who work together, whatever they're working on, and where it makes sense for us to work together, we do, right? So it really becomes, ethically, we may have common ethics and, and worldviews, but we're called to do different things and in different ways. So how do we come together to support each other where it makes sense, rather than arguing, oh, well, you're Arab, you're South Asian, you're African American, you're Senegalese, right? How do you, how do we get into bypassing those irrelevant particularities while respecting those particularities for what it brings to the common work? Yeah, I think, you know, my initial thought is just that I, I agree um, in that if unity means sameness, um, then I'm not sure that that's, you know, the, the, the best way for um, Muslims to contribute, you know what I mean, as, as Muslims have contributed to this country since its founding, right, that it hasn't been sameness. I go back to this phrase range of expression and range of contribution, you know, and I don't think that we can get that if the goal is sameness, right. Um, but one of the things that I, I also advocate for and I and I find a lot of joy when I experience it is understanding that the work um, and the efforts have to be ongoing um, that there's not a once we get here let's stop right or that there's not an end that what we're really building and looking for is you know a healthy working relationship <laughs> you know um within our various communities and with with communities that um, are not muslims and that type of work um and and i'm i'm use i'm taking this from you know people who do lots of anti-racism work and my own anti-racism work is not a one-off you know it's not something that you can just do once um, because we are all still fighting against all of these legacies um, inherited, inherited, we are still dancing in the sun, sunshine and the shade, right? And we have to, we're, we're trying to find the best way, right, to, to move through those spaces and to move through those moments um, together, right? Not necessarily um, identically, but I think that this investment in that um, you know, reminders benefit believers, right? And that we have to continue to remind ourselves and to continue to work and to continue to remind others and to continue to grow, right? Um, and to evolve and all of these things. So I think that there is a call for a, um, a continuity and, and a spiritual practice, if you will, or a social practice that mirrors a spiritual practice, which is that we are always in process and in progress um, and in constantly working on the next iteration and a better iteration as opposed to the end, you know, um, and, and that we, we've kind of re reached it because, I mean, maybe, you know, if, if we've reached it, then maybe that's general, you know, <laughs> and that's not where we are right now. So, yeah. I like that connection of spiritual and social. I think that's uh, a good way to think about things. Um, okay, I think that's the end of our audience questions. And unless you all have anything to add, I will wrap it up. Um, anyone want to add anything? I, I will just end coming back to where we began. Um, you know, uh, think about the conversations we are part of already. What are the conversations we're entering into? Are we taking time to listen and understand what those conversations is rather than simply inserting ourselves and assuming we know we're there? Um, and, and part of that also means being active. Once you're ready to engage the conversation, how do you bring other people into conversations you want to have while still respecting the position that they're starting from rather than saying, why aren't you there with me? Remember that, that you are you had to get there as well. And, and I said this in our, uh, uh, our warm-up session before the public session began, that as a scholar of Muslims in America, if, if I am not always learning and being invited into new places, then the way I'm doing my work is the wrong way because I cannot have the totality of that knowledge. I can always be brought to new and better places. Um, so, you know, I'll just, I'll leave that as my closing thought. Inshallah.
Yeah, my, my only addition would be, I mean, in agreement totally, and that the more that I learn and the more that I expand, the more that I change the way that I move through the world and through spaces, that what I believe impacts the way that I behave <laughs> and the way that I engage with others and with people who are like me, with people who are not like me, with with communities across a range of expressions that are Muslims and that are non-Muslim, and um, and with the the dream of Americanness or the American dream or the range of American identities um, in the United States. So I think just this um, in in connecting with um, the spiritual um, and the social or the sacred and the social is this idea of once I have new information, right, um, about what I believe and or what I understand, how does that translate into how I behave and how I contribute? And that there are an infinite number of ways to do that, right, um, to contribute, that there's no one way and that that is part of the excitement is that we all get to find our own way. Thank you both. Um, we're only slightly over time and I'm going to take that to be a, a victory. Uh, I really, really appreciate you both being here. This was such a great conversation. I have a lot to think about. Um, for the audience, um, I just have a couple of announcements. I'm going to share some resources in the chat uh, in a second. So if you're looking for those, um, please check out the chat. Uh, this upcoming week, we also have a number of young adult conversations related to this topic. Um, and for that information, you can check out the Smiley USA uh, social media platforms. And then um, I think this Thursday, uh, we have Dr. Omid Safi, um, and he'll be talking about the path of radical love, linking love and justice. Um, and he will introduce us to how Muslim sages like Rumi are rooted and grounded in the Quran and the very being of the prophet and form a whole lineage of lovers of God and humanity that extend down to our own age. And that is Thursday, July 2nd at 8 p.m. Central Time. Um, and I think we'll throw in a link in the chat if you wanna register for that. And lastly, there will be a survey that will pop up on your screen um, at the end of this session and data and feedback are important. So we would really appreciate if you would take the survey. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists and we hope to see you at the next one.